Hey all, welcome to Circle of Town. Today, Mick Ronson, a legend, and uh, we're talking the David Bowie era with Ziggy Stardust. So before we get into it, I just want to put this out there that I make fun of modern music. It's on rails. It's to a click track. There's fake drums and the rest of it. I've tried to do this one in the past and it's just been one long vanilla sausage. So bear with me on this one. I'm not trying to recreate his tone because it's impossible. And now some of you are going to spit out your tea and your monocle is going to fall into your lap. But I used a Mesa Boogie Recto. So let's see how it turns out. There's a reason. There's a reason. Okay, don't, don't throw plates at me. <laughs> All right, let's just get straight to it. So, Mick Ronson, Ziggy, Stardust, Era, Circle of Town. <laughs> And we're back. So, what in the name of Crumb's balls am I doing trying to play Ronson with a recto, with a massive boogie recto? I've made fun of it recently. There's actually some things that I kind of blew my mind about what I thought that he used, you know, tone bender and big Marshall cabinets and the rest of it, versus what he actually used in the studio for this particular album. So legend has it that he used the Marshall Major, a 200 watt Marshall with KT-88s, right? But unbeknownst to Mick, so even Mick didn't know this during that period, they removed two of those KT-88s. So essentially it was dropped down to 100 watts. Yeah, so I think it was, was it Robin Mayhew, that was the guy that removed the tubes. So it was the Marshall Major called the Pig, but it was modded to shit. And it had actually, on this album, there was no speakers. It was not hooked up to the Celestian Greenbacks, to the Marshall cabinets, those big stacks you see everywhere. No, it went straight into the desk. It went into the Marshall Major, out of a DI. There's XLR uh, outputs on it, and that would go into the desk. So he had that thing cranked, obviously going off a dummy load so that you know his amp wouldn't blow up. And that's how he got that sound. But there's another aspect of it as well. Can't see it behind me. All of his songs, he had the wah cocked. So if you, you let's say uh, Slash or Kirk Hammett and people like that, they use the wah a lot. So it goes wow, wow. It flips, it, it uh, cycles through frequencies when you flap it up and down. So the, the further forward you push it, the more trebly it gets. So he liked that. So he had this massive gorilla ballsy Marshall, but then he would tame it with the Coctua. So and like, there's a misconception. It was a crybaby Wawa, but there's a misconception that he used the tone bender on the album. Tone bender is a fuzz pedal. 
from the live shots from the Ziggy uh, tour, especially the ones in America. You can see it on the floor. But he didn't actually use that. And there is something, there's an octave up somewhere on Ziggy. And I, you know, so it could have been him actually playing, uh, playing it higher. Because I hear him slide down at one point in the tracks and everything. Or he also could be pinch harmonic in it. But there is some sort of thing that happened with his setup where it would almost uh, create almost like an octave type of effect. It could have even been a pickup. It could have been another pedal where they switched on and off because you can hear the chords beneath it. I'm getting, I'm getting too nerdy now. The light isn't great in here, so you can't really see my settings. But that's the charm of a massive boogie, right? They don't have chicken head knobs which point in the right direction. But anyway, see the slave out on the back? That is the key. I went out of the slave and I went into the my preamp. It's a 1073 style preamp. Two of them, one after another, ratcheted up the gain. So it's a little bit of gain in the amp, a lot of gain in the preamps. And that's how Ronson did it back in the day. And obtainium, because those amps are like hen's teeth. So he had his famous Black Beauty 1968 Gibson Les Paul Custom. He, he removed all the paint on it. So they were, it used to be black back when he was in the band called The Rats and everything. You can see him with his Black Beauty Les Paul. So there's lots of little things in this that are, you know, smoke and mirrors. And we got this information from the man himself, from Ken Scott, the uh, producer on that album. So, and say producer, the... Uh, the funny thing is that Mick really deserved a few credits because he was a classically trained violinist. It's, it's weird, a guy from Hull, you know. <laughs> Life, he did use effects like the Echoplex and uh, he'd use the Tone Bender and things like that. But yeah, that album was dry through, you know, not even speakers. I couldn't believe it when I heard it. And I was like, are you sure? And so yeah. And there was a uh, Hagstrom 12 string as well. You can barely hear the 12 string on it. It's more, you can hear the strums and everything, but there's so many shakers going on and the production is kind of weird. It's a, when you really listen to it, when you really listen to the production of uh, Ziggy, it's kind of uh, lo-fi. The, the myth of heavy music where, you know, everything's supposed to be huge bass and the rest of it. The older recordings, because yeah. you didn't have that much low end. No, it. absolutely not. The one 5.1 I've done, was uh, Ziggy. I've, I've seen complaints from some people saying how thin it sounds. Well, in comparison to a lot of the modern stuff, yeah, very. Which would you prefer? I can make it mod modern sounding or I can make it sound the way it did originally. That's what made it a classic. Tony Visconti, the producer, you know, he was told that uh, you should look up Mick because he was a brilliant guitarist in the band The Rats. And so he went, he drove actually both of them, the, the producer and Bowie, drove to, to meet Mick and Mick was at his day job at the time. And he was painting the lines on a rugby pitch, you know, one of those machines and trundling along and all of a sudden David Bowie turns up, you know, the man in a dress says, you know, do you want to come down to, to London and check out my new, um, you know, I need a guitarist and the rest of it. So he goes down the same day, David says, oh, tonight I'm uh, doing a session with John Peel. And I've talked about John Peel a lot with the British scene. I made a joke in my last video where all roads lead to Engelbert Humperdinck when it comes to the underground. And it was a joke because in Killing Joke, Geordie's mother went to see Engelbert Humperdinck and then she saw a Hendrix and then she got the guitar bug, got him a Gibson, and then he... Geordie went on to practically create industrial metal <laughs> and, you know, industrial rock and the rest of it. So now I made a joke about, you know, I got Humperdinck, but when it really comes to the underground in the UK, all roads do lead to John Peel, you know, Napalm Death and all sorts of uh, luminaries uh, that I've actually done that are British based. They all went on his show. So day one, day one, Ronson, they practiced just for an hour together before and they went on to BBC to record a session. So from straight away, boom, and they were, and they were there. <laughs> How crazy is that, right? One minute, one minute, you're on a field, you're trundling along, and the next minute you're in the BBC studios with David Bowie. <laughs> so from that, he actually, uh, so he moved in with David Bowie. He had a, a bit of a mansion, which only cost him about seven pounds a month or something ridiculous to, uh, to rent this mansion. And 
they were called the hype. They weren't the spiders yet. And they were broke. David Bowie was broke. They, the management structure didn't have any money. In fact, on their early gigs, um, where they'd get the outfits, because David Bowie was big on the look, so they would dress them up. I think Mick was dressed dressed up as like a uh, Italian gangster type of thing, you know, with a white suit. They were so broke, they they run out of money. So the rest of the band had their outfits, and David Bowie they they, they didn't have any left enough money left in the budget for David Bowie's outfit. So they did Hunky Dory, and then they did they went on to do the Ziggy album, and then it happened. They played Starman on top of the pops and this thing started something a cla- it was a catalyst where david on stage just innocently put his arms around mick on stage and in a, like a gesture but everybody was so um homophobic back then that was like a big gesture to be live on top of the pops with his arm around a man oh no but david learned from that he, he saw the hype that that created and people watched that display that I'll put a link in the top comment and you have to watch it. It's just amazing. Think of Great Britain and the rest of it. But think about seeing that. I mean, T-Rex did open the door to the, the the glam rock era, but Ziggy then came out with this space age thing on top of it. And I think it I think it generated from uh, David Bowie's wife at the time. She saw Star Trek and saw the big boots and the rest of it. So that's kind of how, you know, she had, she had a big... Uh, David Bowie had quite a lot of help along the way, especially from Ronson, especially from his his ex wife. It was uh, she was she was like a almost like a fifth member. <laughs> just when he saw the hype that generated just from that gesture, then they rolled with it. So on the U.S. tours, you get the pictures. The was it called the guitar fellatio pictures came up just to really push that androgynous thing. And I, I was watching a uh, a documentary on Mick Ronson, and they were trying to play down how you know David Bowie was bisexual and he was one of the first people I think as a rock star to come out as being bisexual that's a fucking big deal but they they tried to say that he wasn't really gay or he wasn't really bi he was more into women but I've got some evidence that will refute that because he tried to shag my dad <laughs> my dad was the drummer of Badfinger and back then he looked like a you know a, a little elf and he was a good looking man but once when he was, we would listen to David Bowie and I was going, oh, he said, yeah, he tried to shag me once. We were in a nightclub and he was a, he was just giving me the eyes and sidling over to me and the rest of it. And I was like, it's kind of cool. I'm gay for rock and roll, whatever. <laughs> yeah, so they made an odd couple. You know, they I think Mick actually referred to him and Bowie as a couple. I think the symbiotic relationship really, really launched David Bowie into the stratosphere. And unfortunately, he kind of left the rest of the Spiders. Uh, he took Mick on for a few, one or two albums afterwards. When when the cutoff period happened between David and Mick, both of them went to shit. You know, uh, David Bowie was just blackout on cocaine constantly. And also, you know, Ronson tried his own solo stuff, but it fell a bit flat because he wasn't really a front front man. He was just a perfect foil. I mentioned it a lot, you know, that the, the bedroom guitarist, the DIY guy, I wasted 20 years of my life doing it. You know, you need somebody else to play off. But it is a shame because I think it was the keyboard player that uh, they were just chatting on the tour in America and they said, so how much are you on? And the keyboard player was saying like something like, oh, I think I'm on about 800, 800 uh, pounds a, a week or whatever or something, something like that. I can't remember the figure. And the rest of the spiders just, their jaws dropped. They were on 40 pounds a week. When the spider said, okay, we're gonna have to get representation, you know, to a manager or something so, so we can get a fair cut. And that then really did the seed, the seeds of uh, of malcontent in the band. So David Bowie, you know, wasn't having any of that, and he actually, on the height, the height of their fame, as the as the Ziggy era, in a a gig, after an encore, he he'd actually told uh, Mick about this just before, but the other band members were clueless. He said, okay, thanks everybody. This is going to be the last song that we ever play. And the bass player and the drummer were looking at each other like, what? And that's it. He was done. And Mick Ronson actually made a point. He said, if we did carry on the Ziggy stuff, if we did 
uh, ride that train. Would you remember it as fondly as you would if they just killed it just like that? And I think I think he's right. I think if you kept on zigging in it, you know, it might just become a bit of a uh, less of a footnote than it was. The fact that he chopped the head off that just it, it's it was rash, but it worked. I think the legend then grows a little bit more, you know. So it's it's almost like when a musician dies, he becomes more legendary, you know, like Nirvana or things like that. I think almost like when he killed off Ziggy, it's the same effect. And I think, uh, but Mick got ripped off, ripped off big big style because he was huge in the production aspect of it. All everyday studio thing. No, this is that chord. This is you know, he was really the conductor, you know, and. Uh, yeah, it's a shame. All right, chaps, thanks for watching. I don't go away yet, and at the end of this, there's going to be some more information from the man himself who recorded the Ziggy Stardust album. And But really, a huge thanks to Colin Blades. This is the guy that runs the Mick Ronson gear page on Facebook, so search Facebook for Mick Ronson gear page. Give it a like. Tell him uh, I said hi. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame needs Mick Ronson, and he has a petition to induct Mick Ronson into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, because I think he had a bit more of a effect than salt and pepper and the likes of that. Also, a huge thanks to my patrons of Tone. The newest patron of Tone is Neil C. Thanks, Neil. And thanks to Richard P. as well, the Ultimate Savage. Uh, if you guys want to help out the channel, keep this going. This got demonetized, which is fair enough. It's not my music, but I think it's educational. But what am I to say? So that's it. Have a good one. And I'm going to leave you with the wisdom of Ken Scott. All right, chaps. Have a good one. Circle of Tone. His technology is moving so fast we're losing a lot of the 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 great stuff uh, from uh, the past mm -hmm. i think the music and and what's coming out now suffers because those things have been lost right you, I, you talk a, a, a lot in the book and a lot in your interviews about the fact that with all this technology it's, for essentially it's a lot of rubbish it, yeah well yeah and um for everything for all this the parametric eqs and all the uh, you know, all the equipment that they have nowadays, the recordings are crappier than ever. Well, it, it, see, one, one of the main things for me that I learned very early on, because we were working on four track, first and foremost, you learned to make decisions uh, about what it was going to sound like. But yeah, then, you're married to it. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you, and you learn pretty quickly that a record doesn't sell because a hi hat is 2 dBs higher or 2 dBs lower. It, it's that's bullshit. What's going to sell something is the song and the performance. Mm -hmm. As far as getting the sounds, we had to make sure the sound started in the studio because we didn't have enough equipment to really change it that much to turn it into anything that isn't in the studio. What? Whereas what? now, what happens is, yeah, it's, it's okay, we'll, we'll fix it with plugins or... And uh, compress the crap. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, we'll put the it, auto-tune on the voice. Oh, don't, don't. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll really get me started there. But no, it... it everything's now done in the computer and it shouldn't it should be in the studio we in the control room are there to capture what happens in the studio right if it's not happening there it ain't gonna happen but we as humans we turn it, it's all or nothing I, I use the story of uh, the first time I ever heard a wah wah pedal I thought, whoa what a great sound that's incredible two weeks later it's on every bloody record that comes out it, it <laughs> super tramp David Bowie Beatles. We used one form of reverb, one either, uh, either a, an EMT plate or a chamber, mm -hmm. one for everything. These days you, you'll pull up a mix that someone's done and there is a different reverb on every single solitary thing and it just makes this using the one there's this cohesion that pulls everything together using all of these individual things it just becomes a mess and you, you'll go through and you'll see, oh, well, they've got five EQ different, five different EQ things on it. They're compressing it, they're limiting it, they're doing it on every single track. It's ridiculous. Right. If you get it right in the studio in the first place, you don't need all of that. Yeah, when you're when you're miking guitar like with Steve Morris, is that it? Yeah. From Pixie Dragon. Yeah. 
he's such a consummate player. Absolutely. What, what do you really have to do? And precisely. That's that's why my, that that's the whole thing with my career. It's just I've got to work with such amazing people, which has made my life so simple. And I think it was Metallica that had the problem that people were actually buying. I think it, it was Guitar Hero or, or one of those because the quality on that was better than the CD mm -hmm. that was put out. When we reach that point, it, it, you've got to start worrying about what we're putting out there. Right, it, it's maybe lunacy. A lot of people don't realize the dynamics are missing. You're right, and the tr the trouble is that because of technology moving into everyone's bedrooms and garages, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of dreck out there. So it's really about, you know, it's this close mic in the, uh, f from the forums and then from YouTube that has fucked music up, in my opinion. You've got to get a little bit of the room, a little bit of the movement, a little bit of the color. And now everything's so close and it's so hi-fi and sterile that it's just, uh, it's all music, guitar music these days is almost unlistenable compared to it. It's like so fatiguing. So you've got to start thinking, man. What write the songs? The songs are so important, and the 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 arrangement and everything. So Mick actually became an arranger. He became um, he would write musical scores, and he's been on some albums. I never had any idea that he did the score and the and the the violins and everything for uh, Walk on the Wild Side. He worked on that album, you know, with Lou Reed, and Lou Reed could barely sit up. He should have. You know, he, he, in that, he, Lou Reed made the joke is that he had a pot cookie and ate it, and then he woke up like a, two months later and he'd, he'd worked with Mick Ronson and all sorts of stuff. 